Okay. Now we're currently looking at texts in the Old Testament that refer to aspects of Jesus other than his suffering, death, and resurrection, and the need to have faith in him. That was if we first looked at a group of texts that fell fall in that category, and we're now looking at texts that refer to aspects of Jesus other than that. And we first looked at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in which God, soon after Satan introduced sin into the world, he promised that a male descendant of Eve would defeat Satan this enemy of God and enemy of mankind. And then we saw in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, 18, 18, and 22, 18, that of all the people in the world, just people everywhere, of all the people in the world, that this Savior, this one who would bless all the nations of the earth through his defeat of Satan, which would be a blessing to all mankind, that this person would be a descendant of Abraham. And then we saw in Genesis 26, 4 and 28, 14 and 49, 8, that of all the people in the world, he also would be a descendant of Isaac, a descendant of Jacob, and a descendant of Judah. So he would be an Israelite, So this small subset of humanity, he would be an Israelite, and then he would be a small subset of that subset. He would be from the tribe of Judah. And then we saw in 2 Samuel 7 and in Psalm 89 and Jeremiah 23, 5, that of all the descendants of Judah, that this Savior, this ultimate anointed one, the Messiah, that he would be a descendant of King David. And right when we ended, we we started looking at Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and that's where I want to pick back up. But I pointed out in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, that the prophet, he sees a hundred years or so into the future, when the Babylonians will invade Judah, and he sees their ultimate rescue and their return by the power of God. And then in in chapter 4, verse 11, he directs his attention to his own time in which the Assyrian king's international horde of mercenaries was threatening Jerusalem, and that's in the time of Hezekiah. This is 701 B.C. And he takes that situation, that threat of God's people, he takes that as representational or paradigmatic of all assaults by unbelievers on the people of God, including the ultimate battle that will be waged against God's people in the end. And then in chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, God promises victory for his people through his power. And the enemies see that gather together, they're lusting to destroy God's people. They don't realize that they've played into God's hands. They've gathered. He has brought them together. He's gathered them together for destruction by his people. And that's, as I say, that's a paradigm that, that indicates how God will be dealing with this situation at future times. And in Micah 5, 1 and 6, it repeats the pattern. You see in 4, 9 and 10 and 4, 11 to 13, where it moves from this distressful situation to a situation of salvation. In Micah 5, 1, it speaks of Israel being under siege and her ruler being humiliated. But deliverance is now said to come by the Messiah. See, Israel's long-awaited ruler. You see where it says, whose coming forth is from ancient days? He's this long-awaited ruler who will come forth for Yahweh. He will come forth for Yahweh, and he will shepherd the people in the strength of Yahweh, and whose greatness shall reach the ends of the earth. You see, so we, we have here, this is, this is messianic, and the reference to the Assyrians as the enemies in verses 5 and 6, that's representational. You see, as you see in in the book of Revelation, a lot of times prophets will take 
the enemies that are currently there and then they will use them to depict future enemies. They will describe future circumstances in terms of present threats. So they take them like John will take Rome and he will give you this magnified Rome to, to portray the eventual enemy. And you see that same thing happening here. Now, according to the New Testament, it was widely understood in the first century that this text specified that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. This was widely understood. You see that, for example, in Matthew 2, 3, and 6. It says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So as I'm telling you this and trying to give you some context of how can this be pointing to the Messiah, you say, well, I think you're stretching that. Well, if I am, understand that in the first century it was understood that way. You see, so whatever I'm seeing or telling you, they saw in the first century. You see, for example, in John 7, 41 and 43, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. So here you see in the first century, in Matthew and in John, you see their writing and they indicate that in the first century it was understood that Micah 5.2 was a prophecy of the birthplace of the Messiah. Now a skeptic will say, well, wait a minute, but Matthew and John, these are Christian writers, so maybe they're just fabricating this. It really wasn't understood in the first century to be a prophecy of the birthplace of the Messiah. They're just making that up. So to reinforce that because Jesus is born in Bethlehem, that's what they're doing. Well, that would be a weird thing to do in the first century, wouldn't it? I mean, it's not like you're going to be writing it long time after where nobody would know what the scoop was in the first century. You're writing it in the first century. And if you write it in the first century and you say this is how it's understood in the first century, if that's false, people in the first century will go, what are you talking about? It will hurt your credibility. So, it, I mean, that makes no sense right off the bat, but it's also this fact that it was understood in the first century to be a prophecy of the birthplace of the Messiah. It's supported by the fact that Targum of the Minor Prophets, which it's an, a Targum, it's an ancient Aramaic paraphrase or interpretation of the Hebrew text. So in the first century, the language is Aramaic. Hebrew has moved. And so you have these things, targums, which are, we want to put the Hebrew text in the language that is more familiar. So you have these Aramaic interpretations or loose renderings, which are like uh, mini commentaries at some places, but you have that. It supports this idea that they understood in the first century that Micah 5 2 was a prophecy of the birthplace of the Messiah. New Testament scholar Craig Blomberg, he says, the Targum of the Minor Prophets very explicitly takes this text, Micah 5, 2, as messianic. And you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, you who were too small to be numbered among the thousands of the house of Judah, from you shall come forth before me the anointed one. The anointed one, that's the Messiah. That's what Messiah means, anointed one. And so will come before me the anointed one to, to exercise dominion over Israel, he whose name was mentioned from of old, from ancient times. Then Blomberg continues, other post-Christian rabbinic literature recognized that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. So there's no reason to reject the claim of the Gospels that this information was recognized already in the first century. Okay, as I tell you, it would be weird to me for somebody in the first century to try to blow this by people when they're there and they would know it was a joke if it weren't true. But beyond that, we have support from Jewish sources that say, yes, in fact, this was understood as messianic in the first century. Now, the Ephrata, when he says Bethlehem Ephrata, what's that about? Well, that distinguishes this Bethlehem, 
from the village in northern Israel known as Bethlehem of Zebulun, like in Joshua 19.15. So there was another Bethlehem. And this distinguishes this Bethlehem from that, as Walter Kaiser says, Ephratha was either the ancient name for Bethlehem, for the village itself, David's father was known as an Ephrathite from Bethlehem in Judah, or it was the district in which Bethlehem was located. Either way, it was a way of distinguishing this particular Bethlehem from Bethlehem of Zebulun. So we have this, we have Micah 5 2 is this prophecy that the Messiah, the anointed one, is going to be born in Bethlehem. And what do you know? Jesus is born in Bethlehem. He's born there and he's the prophesied birthplace of the Messiah. That's made clear in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 7, and Luke chapter 2, verse 15. So here we have another prophetic fulfillment. Next I want to look at is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, maybe one of the most famous of the prophecies about Jesus dealing with something other than his suffering, death, and resurrection. But Isaiah, as I've said many times, Isaiah prophesies in the latter part of the 8th century B.C. Now, you know how this works, coming down this way, right? You're you're counting back this way. So it's from 800 to 700 is the 8th century. So the latter part would be, say, from 750 down to 700. So Isaiah is in the latter part of the 8th century B.C. And the political setting of Isaiah chapter 7 is that Syria... Not Assyria, okay, the nation of Syria and the nation of Israel. You remember after the death of Solomon, the United Kingdom divided into two kingdoms, Israel to the north, Judah to the south? So it's a separate nation. So the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, and the Syrians, the setting here in in chapter 7 is that they are ready to attack Judah, the southern kingdom and to depose the Judean king Ahaz because Ahaz has refused to join their alliance against the Assyrians. The Assyrians are the big boys on the block, okay? And so we have Syria and Israel, they're in a pact, and they say, we think that together we can resist them, but we need to bring Judah in. And Judah says, I'm not going for it. And so they're going to attack Judah, and they're going to depose King Ahaz, and they're going to put someone on the throne who's more amenable to their desires. Now, this is around 735 B.C. And God then, he sends Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, to strengthen Ahaz. Ahaz is worried about this. So he sends Isaiah to him to strengthen him. He tells him, look, he's not going to allow that to happen. I'm not going to let these people uh, defeat you. And then he tells him, he offers to confirm that word by performing a miracle of the young Ahaz's choosing. So he wants to, he wants to reinforce it. He tells him, listen, I'm not going to let that happen. And just to let you know, so you will be even more encouraged and saying, you pick the miracle and I'll do it. Okay? Now, that's, that's pretty significant. I mean, that's, that's quite a deal. But Ahaz refused the offer. You remember with his, his pious sounding, he would not put the Lord to the test. You see, he's not going to put, well, you think, well, what do you mean, we'll put him to the test? He's just offered to you to do this. So what are you talking about? You won't put the Lord to the test. But see, what's going on is that he almost certainly had already decided to court or already was courting the Assyrians for protection rather than the Lord. As you see in 2 Kings 16, 7 and 8, he pays the Assyrians to come and protect him from Israel and Syria. So he's already planning or is already doing this. So when God comes and says, I'm going to protect you, you just go... He's going, hmm, no, 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 that's all right. I, I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't want to put the Lord to the test. It's because he's already showed a lack of faith. He's not trusting in God. He's trusting in the pagan Assyrians to be his protection. So that's what's happening there. And that's why Isaiah tells Ahaz, who represents the house of David, 
He says in verse 13 that he is wearying Isaiah's God. You see? So that leaves this question of some uncertainty as to whether the royal house regarded Yahweh as its God. He's, this, he's wearying Isaiah's God. And then we get to 7, 14 to 17. Now, you'll notice here I took verse 14 from the English Standard Version. For different reasons, I won't, you know, go into all of them. But then I took 15 to 17 from the New English Translation. Okay, both scholarly translations. There are reasons I favor the New English Translation of those verses. So, Isaiah, you see, he says, look, because he was trying God's patience, you see the therefore He tells him in verse 13, you're wearying God. He's wearying Isaiah's God. It is for that reason, because he is trying God's patience. He says, therefore, because he's trying his patience, the Lord insists on giving him a sign anyway. He said, no, 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 it's okay. You know, not, my, I'm so pious, I don't want to put God to the test, when in reality what he's doing is I'm, I'm being unfaithful to God. So God says, no, not so fast. <laughs> not so fast. I'm going to give you a sign. You see, you're going to get a sign, but it's now going to be a sign of both salvation, deliverance, and judgment. Okay, you're going to get a sign of both. The sign will be that the Alma, that's the Hebrew word, the Alma will conceive and bear a son and name him Emmanuel. Okay, so you're going to have a sign. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you because you're wearying me. And that sign is now going to be a sign not only of deliverance, but also of deliverance and judgment. Now, the Hebrew word Alma, okay, it refers to an unmarried young woman. An unmarried young woman, though she would be a virgin because she was not yet married, that's an implication rather than the direct meaning of the word. Okay? It's an implication from it. The word tends to emphasize youth rather than virginity, but context can bring the latter to the fore. It's similar to our English word maiden, which is dropped out of use. But it refers to a young, unmarried woman. So the sign is going to be that the maiden, he says the maiden, now probably referring to a specific young woman who was present when this was delivered, that she will conceive, she will give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Okay, which, as you know, means God with us. Now, it's an unusual name. In fact, this is the only time that name is given in the Bible. So it's a very odd name for someone to have, and it's referred to in Matthew 123, citing back to this. So you have going to give this child name Emmanuel. Then following the New English translation, which you also see reflected, by the way, in the King James, the New King James, and the New American Bible, so it's not eccentric. But following that translation, this child will eat sour milk or cream or curds and honey, which will help him know how. That's why I picked the New English translation. That's the key here, you see. It's how they take this preposition. It says it it will help him to know how to reject evil and choose what is right. Okay, and then again, following the New English translation... The particle that's at the beginning of verse 16, quoting from the New English Translation, note now, it says, introduces the entire following context. Verses 16 to 25, which explains why Emmanuel will be an appropriate name for the child, why he will eat sour milk and honey, and why experiencing such a diet will contribute to his moral development. So verse 16 here, it says, here is why this will be so. Okay, so I think that's what's happening here. And he tells Ahaz that the child will be named Emmanuel, which again means God with us, because before he gets very old, before he knows how to reject evil and choose what is right, 
the land of the two kings who are threatening Ahaz, meaning the land of Israel and the land of Syria, the land of those two kings that Ahaz fears, that land will be desolate. Okay, the child will be a sign, now a sign in the sense of a tangible reminder. You see, he will be there, this physical reminder, this tangible reminder of God's presence, which will manifest itself in his deliverance of Ahaz from the threat that Ahaz is facing. So clearly there's an 8th century B.C. element to the sign. There's an 8th century B.C. element to it. And yet the child also will be a sign of God's presence in judgment against Judah for its lack of faith as represented by Ahaz's relying on political alliances for protection. So it's now going to be, yes, it's going to be this God with us. You're going to have this tangible reminder of God's presence but it is going to be a presence that is now going to be reflected not only in deliverance and salvation, but in deliverance and in judgment. Okay, so this is what what is going on. And he declares in verse 17 that God will bring the Assyrians against Judah. So here is Ahaz, and he's worried about Israel and Syria, and God says, here's this tangible reminder, I'm going to be with you for deliverance against Israel. Israel and Syria, but by the way, I'm then bringing the Assyrians against you. So deliverance and judgment. So he's going to bring the Assyrians against Judah, and as Ahaz, Judah's refusal to trust the Lord caused him to transform his blessing into judgment. You now see Isaiah's prophecy turns from relief from the danger that is posed to Ahaz by Israel and Syria to judgment by other nations. That's why Emmanuel will eat curds and honey. The people are going to be forced to subsist on goat's milk and honey because the Assyrians will have destroyed the crops. And that's what he says in verses 20 to 22. That's what's going to happen. This fulfillment will help him, will help Emmanuel, will help him make right choices because seeing that will reinforce his trust in God, which is the beginning of wisdom. So as this child grows and he sees the fulfillment of what God has done, that will reinforce trust in God and trust in God is the beginning of wisdom. So that is how eating curds and this will help him in making right judgments, knowing the right and the wrong. It will reinforce his trust in God, which is the beginning of wisdom. So this is what I think is happening here. So it will also force the people to acknowledge God's presence with them, Emmanuel, in judgment. Okay, so when he says, here is why this will be so, and then he lays out and explains that. Now, with many people, okay, don't think I'm the lone ranger on this. But with many people, I think Emmanuel, at the first level, Emmanuel in the 8th century context was Isaiah's son, Mahar Shalal Ahashbaz, whose conception and birth is announced in the next chapter, the chapter immediately after the portrait of blessing and judgment of which the promised child will be assigned. So you have this talk, here's this child going to be assigned. In the very next chapter, we get the birth of Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. But that 8th century fulfillment does not exhaust the meaning. It doesn't exhaust the meaning of the prophecy. Rather, the son born at that time in that context as a sign to Ahaz of deliverance and as a sign of judgment, that that doesn't exhaust that. It's a representative. He's a representative. You see, he's a type of the full and ultimate fulfillment that will take place in the miraculous birth of Jesus. So we have here, you see this, you have this fulfillment, but it's pregnant with other things. 
You see, and so it's fulfilled at one level in the 8th century context, I'm convinced in, in Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, but that doesn't exhaust it, obviously. But now you say, well, there's reason to believe. You say, Why do you, what leads you to think this, that Isaiah's son is the Emmanuel that is talked about here? Well, first, there's reason to believe in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, that they're a condensed allusion to Isaiah taking the virgin, the maiden, the young unmarried girl in 714, to be his wife. And if you want to read more about that, you can read Herbert Wolf's article in the Journal of Biblical Literature. Uh, he, he goes in and talks about why is there reason to think 8, 1, and 2 is an allusion to that. And you can see here where it says, for, like in 2, and I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest, Zechariah. So he makes the case that here you have a condensed allusion to Isaiah taking this young woman to be his wife. And so in, in taking her to be his wife, you see now his, his his first wife probably died, right? The first wife, who's the mother in 7.3 of Shere Jashub, she probably has already died, perhaps in childbirth. And so we have Isaiah who takes this maiden who was present when he delivered this prophecy and taking her to be his wife, that's naturally and promptly followed in verse 3 by his having sexual relations with her. And then the consequent birth of the son whom Isaiah is told to name, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. In other words, the young woman here in Isaiah, in chapter 7, verse 14, she, she was a virgin there because she wasn't yet married. She's then married to Isaiah in 8, 1, and 2, and then conceives the promised son in the normal manner in verse 3. See, unlike Mary... Unlike Mary, this young woman was not still a virgin at childbirth. She, the prophet marries her, goes into her, and she has this child who is a son. But this child is, this child is a type of a greater fulfillment that's coming with Mary and with Jesus. Now that you say, well, why do you think that, that Mahar Shalal Hashbaz is the initial Emmanuel? is the child of 7, 14, Isaiah 7, 14, 16. Well, it's suggested to me and to many other people, not only by the fact that his birth is reported immediately after the portrait of blessing and judgment of which Emmanuel will be the sign. So we have this talk here about there's going to be blessing and judgment, this child will be a sign. And what do you know? Here's a child. Okay, well, right away I'm thinking, is that, are we to understand that as a connection there? But not only that, after that, but also by the fact in chapter 8, verse 4, it declares that before Mahar Shalal Hashbaz gets very old, now it's before he can talk that Syria will be defeated by the Assyrians. Okay, does that, does that ring a bell? What you're seeing in chapter 7? 7, 7.16. Okay, when we're talking there in 7.16 about Emmanuel, it says that both, Syria and Israel would be eliminated by the time the child knows how to reject evil and choose the good. Okay, which would be later, probably in Jewish thinking, this would be on the verge of adulthood. Let's say 12 or 13, where the child's judgment of choosing the good and rejecting the bad is considered mature enough for adulthood. Well, if that's the understanding, well, then that's 12 years roughly. Okay, so he says, listen, by the time the child is roughly 12, both of them are going to be taken out. And here he says, by the time the child can speak, okay, two, two-ish, then we're going to have Syria is going to be taken out. Both by the time he's 12, Syria by the time he can talk. And what do you know? If this 735, we have the prophecy... We then have the pregnancy. We then have the birth. And who do you think is rendered a puppet state by the year 732 by the Assyrians? Well, Syria is. Right within a couple of years, Syria is rendered a puppet state. Well, what happens to Israel? Well, by the time the child's 12 in 722 or 721 BC, the Assyrians complete their conquest of Israel, the northern kingdom, by destroying Samaria. Samaria. 
So this is what I think is going on. And just as the removal, just as the removal of Judah's enemies at Emmanuel's young age was followed in chapter 7, verses 17 to 25 by an Assyrian invasion, by an Assyrian invasion of Judah, well, so the removal of Syria at Mahar Shalal Hashbaz's young age, it's followed in chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, by an, by an Assyrian invasion of Judah. So there's again a parallel there that's reinforcing for me that in the first instance, that's who's being talked about. And in addition, in chapter 8, verse 8, right in the middle of the discussion of Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, Isaiah addresses Emmanuel. Right in the middle of the discussion, he addresses Emmanuel, and in chapter 8, verse 18, Isaiah says that the children given to him are signs, which is how Emmanuel is described in chapter 7, verse 14. All right, so a lot of these things point this way to me, that this is the initial fulfillment. Then you say, well, how can he possibly be Emmanuel when his name's Mahar Shalal Hashbaz? One's named Emmanuel, one's named, you know, what are you, crazy? No, I am crazy. She amen that. But the use of different names for the same child, I mean, that's certainly not unprecedented, is it? I mean, Rachel called the son she died delivering. Rachel named him Benoni. Rachel named him Benoni, and then Jacob called him what? Benjamin. Okay, that's Genesis 35, 18. Robert Chisholm comments, he's an Old Testament scholar, he says the name Emmanuel, given by the mother, she gave that name, 714, would emphasize the basic fact of God's presence while the name Maharshal al-Hashbaz, given by Isaiah in 8.3, meaning one hastens to the plunder, one hurries to the loot, would explain exactly how God would be present in judgment. Giving the child a different name at the time of his birth would also be highly ironic, for it highlights how God's presence, normally viewed as a positive reality, had been transformed into something dark and ominous by Ahaz's unbelief. And so you can see that working that way. And I think that's really what, what you have going on there, is that, that we have it now. This first Emmanuel was a promised son who signified God's special presence and his involvement with his people in the immediate crisis of the 8th century B.C. So that's a, he's, he's this tangible reminder, a sign in that sense, a sign as a marker, a tangible reminder of God's involvement, his special involvement and his presence with the people in that crisis. But he foreshadowed. He foreshadowed a greater literal Emmanuel. A greater literal Emmanuel who would manifest that presence in a far greater way. You see, and thus would express God's love and commitment in a greater way. That this prophesied child foreshadowed a greater future fulfillment, it's hinted at. Okay, you say, well, you just get to go back and make up stuff about what has foreshadowing. Do you see any reason in the text to think that there's this forward look? Well, yeah, I do. I do. There are a number of things in here. First, the fact that prophecy is addressed not only to Ahaz, but to the house of, the house of David, which is an abstract entity. It's an abstract entity that continues beyond the lifetimes of any individual's and in which the Messiah is born. But more importantly, in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, which is part of the literary unit that began in chapter 7, verse 1. In fact, John Oswald, in his commentary, says, in this segment, Isaiah reaches the climax of the section begun in chapter 7, verse 1. So he looks at 9, 6, and 7 and says it's the climax of that. All right, so I'm saying that you at least have in the same literary unit you have here in 9, 6, and 7, there's mention of a child being born who's the ideal Davidic deliverer. 
This child being born here, one who's described in terms that go beyond any purely human ruler. Look at this child, what's said. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. That's a pretty exalted talk, right? Now, even if, even if you say, well, they're hyperbolic descriptions of a more immediate descendant of David or a more immediate Davidic king, well, they certainly carry messianic overtones, don't they, when you're talking this way? Wonderful counselor, mighty God. So what, what is there to make you think that the, the prophecy that we're looking beyond its immediate fulfillment, that that doesn't exhaust it? Well, I see it in there. I see it in this. As Chisholm, he explains the concept this way. He says, Jesus the Messiah is the fulfillment of the Davidic ideal prophesied by Isaiah, the one whom Emmanuel foreshadowed. Through the miracle of the incarnation, he is literally God with us. Not merely a tangible reminder of God's presence. Matthew realized this, and we would see the Spirit of God in Matthew, who looks and sees and says, ah, you see, pull that baby out. You see, draw out what is latent. And that's what you have him doing here. He says that uh, Matthew realized this and applied Isaiah's ancient prophecy to Emmanuel's birth to, of Emmanuel's birth to Jesus. The first Emmanuel was a reminder to the people of God's presence and a guarantee of a greater child to come who would manifest God's presence in an even greater way. The second Emmanuel is God with us in a heightened and infinitely superior sense. He fulfills Isaiah's Emmanuel prophecy by bringing the typology intended by God to realization and by, by filling out or completing the pattern designed by God. Of course, in the ultimate fulfillment of the type, the incarnate Emmanuel's mother must be a virgin. So Matthew uses a Greek term, Parthenos, that carries that technical meaning. Remember I was telling Alma? That's not inherent in the meaning of the word. It means it's more like maiden that implies virginity. But now when Matthew gives it, he gives you the word that means virgin. Okay? So this is what I think is happening here and being pulled out and what, it, what is going on in the prophecy there. And so Matthew uses that Greek term. So that's how I think it plays out. In other words, I don't think that Isaiah is sitting here saying in that context, by the way, I know you're being threatened here. I'm going to tell you something that has no relevance at all to that. I don't think that's how it's working. First bell? Okay. Let me see how far I can get in, in the next one. I want to look at nine, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. All right, the coming of this ideal Davidic deliverer that we just looked at in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. That's this ideal Davidic deliverer who's described in terms that go beyond any purely human ruler. I mean, you know, wonderful counselor, mighty God, all of that. Well, the coming of that ideal Davidic deliverer in 9 and 6 and 7, that person is introduced, that coming is announced in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And it, it's announced, and here we says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. Now Zebulun and Naphtali, Zebulun and Naphtali, these were tribal allotments. You remember you come into Israel and you divide up the land? Well, these, the, the allotment to the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, that they were allotments that formed most of what would later be Galilee. Most of what would later be Galilee and northward. There were areas, areas of Israel 
that were first humbled by foreign invaders. So here you have Israel, you have Galilee up here, and then they extending up northward. So when people would come, invaders would come, this is the first area that would be humiliated, would be subjugated. And it was also an area that on the border here had a great deal of Gentile and pagan influence. That's what he's talking about here when he says, walked in darkness. You see, they were under that influence because they were on the outskirt. And so he sits here and he says, look, there, these allotments, that's the areas that they were, that you had, they were most influenced by foreign cultures, foreign religions. And Isaiah announces that in contrast to the gloom and the darkness to which those regions were subject in the past, they were going to be the locus of a great light. They were going to be the locus of a great light, the Messiah of chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. They're going to be the locus of that light who will be a source of great joy. And he says in verse 4, who will put an end to oppression. And then he says in verse 5, he will do that by putting an end to warfare upon which oppression rests. So we're talking about somebody who's, you know, this is big league. This is big league. Now, Jesus' fulfillment of this prophecy, it's reported in Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. So again, we have the Spirit of God confirming what you see here, you know, not always clearly in the Old Testament taken on its own, but then when you come back in post-Christ, you look back at it and you go, oh. All right, here you have Matthew 4, 13 to 16. He says, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Well, here's this light. Who's this light? The light is Jesus. Who's Jesus? He's the Messiah. Amen. You see? He's the 9 and 6 and 7 of Isaiah. He's the light. So they've had it rough. They've lived in all this. Living. Now, who's the light right there? The Messiah. And he says, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And so Matthew looks back and says, yeah, that's the Lord fulfilling that in his going there and his being there. Now, I will start the next one, and we know the bell's going to ring, but hey, uh, that's just how that works. All right. Uh, next one, look at uh, Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19. By the way, we're supposed to end uh, today, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> okay? So, well, there goes the bell. But uh, I'm going to borrow a week or two. And then after that, Lord willing, we'll start a study of the prison epistles. I'll begin with Ephesians, and then we'll just go on. Thanks for coming.